What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. Thank you all for joining us as always. So please, 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 as you guys know, hit that subscribe button. It's right there and it's free and that enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like the content, share it, talk about us, be about us, each one teach one here on Unique Access Entertainment. Now today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by one of rap's great producers, artists, personalities, all kinds of things. Derek D. Angeletti, thanks for coming through, sir. Hip, 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 hip hop, hooray. I'm here, baby, Brooklyn's in the house. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, Brooklyn is definitely in the house, man. Thank you. House. Yes, thanks sir. for coming through. Shout out to Dana Dana, as always, for reconnecting us. Shout out to big brother D, Dana Day. Yes, indeed. So uh, I've talked to Deed out a few times over the years, big fan of his work. And, um, you know, we wanted to, I want to take it back to, to the earlier era um, because you've got so much work and we'll get to a lot of it today and, you know, have to have you come back, you know, again later because there's too much to go through in one sitting. But um, I wanted to get with the, you know, take it back to Howard era with the Two Kings and the Cypher because that album, Pyramids to Projects, I always really liked the album and I thought it was extremely well done. So first thing first, what was the, uh, how do you pronounce it? The Bahia Entertainment, the label? Bahia, Bahia. So what, who, who owned that? What was that? I just never really found out what that was. Um, Bahia Entertainment was owned by a gentleman named Gregory, Pre Gregory Peck, Greg Peck. He worked, been in the business a long time doing promotions and radio stuff. He's well known in the game. RCA gave him a little label deal. Um, you know, he was responsible for some things. Our manager at the time, me and Ron's manager, was named Hock Islam. Um, and he was running around with uh, Mr. Gamble and Mr. Huff from Philly International. Um, you know, Hock was in the Nation of Islam and, and uh, Mr. Peck was uh, also Muslim. So um, they found a way to connect. And one day Hock told us, you know, give me your demo. I got a, a, a possible possibility for a deal. So we gave him the demo. And a couple of weeks later, he said, you know, we're going up to New York to meet up with Greg Peck and RCA. We had no clue who he was, but once we found out, we you know, and he looked like us, we were like, okay, maybe we could do this. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was cool. So that's what Greg Peck was. And we were signed to Bahia RCA 1989. And our first record came out in 1990. Yes. And, uh, as we get into the, uh, we'll get into the album in a second, but I wanted to, to understand and learn from you early on, what gave you more than just, I wanna make music or I wanna rap or I wanna do these things. What made you wanna do all of them? Um, honestly, I was rapping in high school. You know, I'm from Brooklyn. I went to Tilden High School. I was rapping then. I had dreams of becoming a rapper. My partner and I, his name was Kenny. We had a group called Ebony and Ivory. And I was, you know, I, you know, prior to that, I was rapping with a group called Ultra Def Defiant 3. Clark Kent was our DJ, because Clark Kent's from my hood, DJ Clark Kent. So we run around Brooklyn, freestyling, doing shows, Skate Key and USA and all these places. By the time I got to Howard, eh, you know, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work anymore. So, um, you know, but there was a lot of guys from New York. This is 1986, so of course, people are rapping on campus, banging on tables. We're doing the WAP because Eric B is out, you know, and all this other stuff. So um, I started, you know, just rapping with the guys and guys were like, yo, you hot, you know, you hot, you hot, you hot. And then, you know, maybe a year or two later, Ron Lawrence heard me rapping one day and just said, yo, why don't you try it? So me, I was ready to just finish school and, you know, find that whatever I was going to do, which I didn't know. I was in med I was in a um, physician assistant school. So I was down in the medical area where everybody else, but I didn't really want to do that, but I was smart enough to, but so once I got in, I realized you can do whatever once you, once you're in, it's like VIP is like, once you get in the club, the next phase is to get in the VIP, you know what I'm saying? But you're in the club, so you can run around, you can do whatever you want to do. So that's what made me kind of want to try everything just because I knew I could. Well, that saying you can do anything, that reminds me of my favorite club uh, growing up in Maryland and going to D.C. was the Ritz. Remember I had all right. the different rooms? At the right, room. right. Exactly. The reggae room, the go-go room. The exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, and, and in each room, there was probably a VIP in each room. Yep. Right. So, but you was straight getting in the room. So that's how I felt. Once I got in, I was going to do my thing. 
Okay. And then um, as far as the creating the music versus uh, writing early on in the two kings and the cypher time, what did you find appealed to you about producing compared to writing lyrics when you started working on pyramids projects? When we worked on the pyramids of project, Ron Lawrence did all the production. I did no production. I had ideas for beats, but I didn't even know how to work the drum machine then. So um, I wrote everything. Well, not everything, but I wrote most of it. Ron did most of the beats. I wrote most of it. Um, and that was our good combination. Um, I didn't really start making tracks until, uh, you know, not literally, but figuratively, a gun was put to my head. That's why I started making beats because it was too technical for me. And back then it was all analog. So it was it just took too long. So I left that up to Ron because Ron is very patient. He's, you know, he's older than me, very patient. He's very technical. So everything had to be clean and tight. You know, Ron it wouldn't leave the studio unless the snares were lined up right. Kick, you know, me, I'm sloppy with it. It just didn't matter as long as I could write to it. But so Ron inspired me to want to make beats, but I didn't want to make them bad enough until later on in life. So with Two Kings and a Cypher, Ron Lawrence pretty much was making most of the tracks. So at least on the version of the album I have, uh, it says you're co-producer. So yeah, because some of the ideas were mine. Okay. Like some of the song ideas were my ideas, but I didn't know how to put it together. So, okay. and I'm the dancer in the group. So some of Ron's beats were very, so I would put a little swag on them, put a little, try, you know, move the hi-hat over for me, for me to write to it so I can get in the pockets. So that way I'm kind of co-producing at that point because I need the song to sound a certain way. So that's how we agreed. It was like written by, co-produced by me, written by both of us. You know, we just partners. But I wanted him to get his shine because he did, you know, he was the teacher at that time for making beats. He was my teacher and he, he did a hell of a job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so given, do you think it was the fact that you guys were personality wise pretty different that enabled you to work so well together? Absolutely. To this day, the fact that we're, we're opposites. Ron go, Ron, you know, the early bird gets up four or five in the morning. I'm going to bed at four or five in the morning. Ron didn't drink or smoke. I did everything, but I, you know, I'm not cocaine and all that other stuff, but I drank, I smoked weed, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, but we had the same vision and we had the same vibrations. So at the end of the day, we coming from different perspectives, but we always met up at a point and that's where our connection was. So there were times when, you know, I might not like the track, but Ron would convince me that you should, you know, listen to it. And then there were times when he might not even like his own track. And I said, yo, dog, this is crazy. Trust me. So, yeah, the combination was, and, and to this day still is ill. Gotcha. And since you had mentioned the game on Huff, the You Know How to Make Me, what, how did that song in particular come about? Exactly like you said, because of the fact that we were working with them and they allowed us, you know, God bless Mr. Huff and Mr. Gamble in 89, 90 and 91, they allowed us to come up to 309 Studios in Philadelphia. That's where we actually recorded most of the Two Kings and Cypher album. Obviously it was through Hock Islam's connection because he was a part of Philly, Philly International, but we got really close with Mr. Huff and Mr. Gamble and they allowed us to come in. And so one of the ideas was since we were there, Mr. Gamble and Mr. Huff had all their masters in the basement. So we literally did You Know How to Make Me off the original master. They let us take it, copy it. We spliced it. I used to splice back it. And we made it what we wanted to make using the original vocals. They let us use the original vocals. We didn't have to clear it. We had to do nothing. So that was a, that was a, a gift from Mr. Gamble. And did you, did you guys, that's phenomenal. Uh, did you guys get to really uh, sit down and talk to them and learn from them a lot or get some of their insight? Oh, absolutely. To this day, I still speak to Mr. Gamble. Don't speak to Mr. Huff too often. Mr. Huff is a man of very few words. That's just because he just don't speak a lot. But back then they used to come in the studio all the time and give us ideas and, you know, tell us what they, we, we'd seek them out and say, hey, you know, you guys are the great ones. Is this okay? Even though, you know, rap was still just getting started. They weren't really up on it like that. They still knew what a good record was. At the end of the day, a good record is a good record. So, yeah. And to this day, you know, Mr. Gamble is still our OG and still an advisor, still a mentor, still a big brother. And what, what do you remember particularly about getting to know them that impressed you or still something they told you that really stuck with you? Um, I think mostly, particularly Mr. Gamble, like I said, you know, Mr. Huff is, you know, 
quiet, but you know, Mr. Gamble, everything was be uh, not about music for him. It was always a life lesson, you know, even to this day. It's, everything's bigger than music for him. Yeah, he'll give us the lessons on music, but it was almost like, pay attention to this because I'm really trying to tell you about this. You get what I'm saying? From real estate to finishing our education, to messages in the music, to how to treat your women, to how to treat ourselves, how to take care of ourselves, how to train your mind, things to look out for, things that you see, but you may think they are what they are, but you know, take another POV, take another angle. So these are the type of things, the jewels that, you know, OGs would drop on us that he didn't have to do, you know, or they didn't have to do. So, um, and then musically, you know, he would just give us musical direction. And sometimes he wouldn't say nothing because he felt like we got it. You know, if, you know, maybe this needs a baseline, guys, or, you know, EQ your vocal a little bit. Here's a trick we used to do with your vocals. Try this, you know, uh, you know, try this with your snares, putting this effect on it. We had an engineer named Jim Gallagher um, that they let us use when we were there. Um, Funky Ned was our engineer. Shout out to Funky Ned from DC. Um, he was you know, in a go-go band, but he, you know, he was our initial engineer. But when we went to Philly International, um, uh, uh, Jim Gallagher was our engineer and he showed us all types of R&B tricks from the early 70s, late 70s, early 80s that they were doing at Philly International with all their great acts. So it was a school, it was, I, you know, PIR was a school, 309 was a school. It was the best school to have, especially when you're just getting started, you know what I mean? And I think that's probably one of the reasons why Ron and I are still here to this day, because a lot of people that came up with us, they're not here no more. And part of it is probably because we had the benefit of some guidance and we and we adhered to it we paid attention to it yeah well those are two of the best teachers you could have had <laughs> right 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 that, that's along with had. you know ron used to run with herbie lovebug and you know he had those guys and i had clark kent i had you know we ended up all of us connecting with rock kims and kid and plays and salt peppers and those type of people growing up botch that ran with big daddy kane these are all different types of people that are around us dana dane growing up. So we got some good surroundings to help us continue on in our career. You know what I mean? If we didn't pay attention to the signs that we would have been idiots, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 So then, so then uh, with the two Kings and the cypher uh, lyrically, and then your look your image, and then a lot of the, the album is very, has a very educational, obviously Afrocentric uh, bent to it. So what, what made that the direction you guys wanted to go at that time? Um, you know, we were at Howard University and back then it was like, culturally it just was overwhelming from where you come from to what you learn once you get there and all the different cultures and all the different personalities and people you meet um, and nationalities. Um, both of us were in the 5% nation prior to coming to Howard. We weren't currently in it, but the lessons were still there. We had a Muslim manager. There was a lot of people around us that were Christians and Muslims and Baptists and, you know, and, but there was a, a lesson to be learned. So we just felt like, <clears throat> why don't we try to, and the times called for it. It was brand Nubians, leaders of the new school, you know, it was just a lot, you know, even tribe, even though they weren't in the 5% nation, everything was Afrocentric, cultural, poor righteous teachers. So, um, Two Kings and a Cypher just came up based off of that. Um, I think the title was probably Ron's idea, I believe. I, I liked it. The way we dress, um, Ron, <clears throat> you know, that was his idea. I didn't want to really put on any garb. I wanted to stay the way I was. And the concept was, um, from Pyramids to Projects, was the concept was, you know, when you see Ron, that was the ideology of how we look during the pyramids. And I'm supposed to look like, uh, how we would look now, but the word project wasn't necessarily a place. It was a double entendre for, from pyramids to projects. Like we were, be, right, we became a project. So it was kind of like we were trying to, you know, mess with people's minds, like make them think. Remember my mother's a doctor of education. So that's, that plays a role into what I, I'm ultimately a teacher to this day without a degree. You know what I mean? So, um, so that, that's, what, that's what went into it, you know, alongside the fact that we round Mr. Gambles and Mr. Huff, the Aka Salams, Mr. Farrakhan, we around all these people and we got Rasbaraka who ended up becoming mayor, you know, all these people are around us. So 
you know, positivity was pretty much the only way we could really go with a little street edge to it because we both ultimately were from the street. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And uh, with the creator had a master plan, that's uh, one of my favorites on the album. So, like, I, so I wanted you to break down lyrically the angle and how, you know, writing that rhyme was. Um. Once again, it's, it's really straight up just blatant lessons. Like in case you didn't know, two plus two is four. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't no real science behind it. It's let me, I'm, I'm pretty much a straight shooter. That's who I am. Uh, shortest distance between two points. I don't really beat around the bush. So I felt like I could have went into all of this, you know, book stuff and gate. Nah, the creator had a master plan. It's really simple. And here's the plan. You know what I mean? And, and that's, that's really what it went into. Um, you know, we are neighbors, something as simple as that. Like it's, eh, you know what I mean? Like, so what I can't dance. Everything was simple to us, to me. Kings of people too. Like in other words, that record was meaning like, we're not so Afrocentric that we can't have no fun. You know, I do smoke weed. I like to dance, girl. I like girls. Like I, 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 you know, so everything was just straight up. We are who we are and these are the lessons, take them or leave them. No real, you don't have to do no real thought into it. There wasn't no real, damn, I got to pick up a book after reading. Nah, it was ABC. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. We didn't really put a lot of 5% lessons in our music, except for one record, we had Definition of a King, where I really went into, but that was short. Short. Yeah. Well, there you have it. So then there you have it, right? <laughs> right. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.